Good morning, guys, and welcome to another episode of A Day in the Life of an Anesthesiologist. My name is Christina. I'm your host. Welcome. Today, if you can't tell by where I am, I am doing OB. A lot of you guys ask, like, do I only do OB or endoscopy? And the answer is no. There are days when I'm in the OR and I'm doing my own cases with my own patients and I'm not supervising, I'm doing the cases myself. The reason why you don't see those on these episodes is because it's just so hard to film. Like I can't, I don't have a minute to myself and I don't, um, I can't film patients. Obviously I don't want to and I can't. Yeah, so today I, I figure it was as good a day as any because I'm on OB and um yeah so let's go over you know what i'll probably show you an or like a sample or and show you the instruments we use and stuff maybe that maybe we could do that that would be kind of fun because it's kind of quiet right now let's give a quick shout out to today's sponsor it is audible thank you so much to audible for always supporting this channel it means the world to me you guys know i've been an audible subscriber for a long time i don't need to reiterate that i I love me some audible um if it sounds squeaky it's because they're redoing the floors in here so that's so why i went to that other room but you can get your first audiobook and two audible originals free for the first 30 days when you text christina to 500 500 or go to audible.com slash christina the reason why i really like audible is because as an anesthesiologist as a busy mom doctor physician whatever you want to call it i don't have time to sit down and read a book and I love reading so you know it's really important to me to um, keep up with the latest not the latest books but just to like keep my mind stimulated so one of the books that I've been listening to <laughs> is Game of Thrones because um, I miss it <laughs> the series ended and I watched the whole series and I loved it the other thing I really like is this audible originals and you get two free selections every single month to an audible original when you have the membership so if you guys don't know how the membership works i thought i would explain that to you because um, a lot of you guys have questions um whenever i talk about audible a membership means that have one credit per month and you can use that credit to purchase any book in the audible library it doesn't matter if that book is 1500 pages long it doesn't matter you use the credit it does not cost you any more so it really works out in the long run savings wise if you like long books and you go through them quickly that's where audible becomes really economical because when you pay what is it the price of a couple of lattes once a month you get one credit and those credits you can save up so say you're going on a big trip want to buy a bunch of books like the week before you go on vacation then what you can do is save them up and so they'll accrue in your account and then that's what i do i'll like i'll buy one new book a couple of new books every couple of months so and it just works out in my favor so i'm trying to decide between the wild heart of stevie nicks or evil eye the mystery of alice by lee bacon maybe i'll maybe i'll listen to this one this is a really nice way to like still listen to something yeah this one looks good i'll add this one to still listen to something without using a credit i listen to these aud audio books on audible back and forth from the hospital so when i go to work it's automatically playing you guys know that i've talked about it ad nauseum but i really really love it as a mom it's really hard to it's really hard to sit you just you know if you have a, if you're a mom or a parent you know that it's really hard to sit down with a book <laughs> like remember that you can visit audible.com slash christina or text christina to 500 500 to get your first audiobook and two audible originals free within the first 30 days of membership so yeah definitely go check that out so i think i'm going to show you around an operating room how does that sound let's do it all right so this is a pixis machine and this is what we get our medications out of so we have to log in use our fingerprint it's all very secure and pharmacy comes and fills these little drawers which pop out um, they come periodically throughout the day or once a day and fill this up with medication so we always have what we need so from here we'll take medicines to either go to sleep or we'll take medicines out for bolusing up an epidural or to start to place a spinal and then back here there's kind of like a toolbox with all sorts of drawers that you can open like so and 
for example, there's gauze in here, we have airways, we have tape, we have blunt uh, needles, we have syringes up top of various sizes, and um, we have some sterilizing wipes, some hand sanitizer, we have a, a use guide that I don't think anybody's ever read in their entire life. This is our regional cart and we use this for placing IVs. Um, there's different things to start, like IV fluids and things like that. These are for art lines, um, three-way stopcocks here, um, IVs, A lines, all that good stuff in case of an emergency. And then here is my little setup for a spinal, so I'm a size six and a half. We have this spinal needle tray, and it's all sterile, and this is everything that's included in it, and then something to sterilize it with, and then we have different various um, supplies up here. And then down here, we have, in case we need to intubate someone or run, um, give them some blood, we have uh, hotline tubing, blood tubing, tubing, whatever you want to call it. These are some sample different sizes of ET tubes. We typically don't have really large ones here because this is OB, so if all our patients are going to be female. Here's some epidural and, and um, I think there should be different types. So here's the spinal. I need to probably stock this up a little bit more. Here's an epidural kit in case we need to get an epidural and the different gloves that we need. So everything is just really nice and clearly labeled and all of the ORs are like this. Here we have the anesthesia machine. This is an um, really kind of like a tried and true machine. This one is a Datex Omega and it's not the newest, but it's very reliable and that's what's important. So um, this is basically what I use whenever I'm, I've got a patient asleep and I'm gonna give them a mix of O2 and air or maybe some nitrous. We've got isofluorine canister here. We've got a sevoflurane canister. Here is where the um, vital signs show up. And then this is the kind of heart of setting the ventilator settings. So I can set my tidal volume, my rate, my I to E ratio, my pressure limit, and my PEEP. I usually have some PEEP if I've got someone intubated, but it's very rare that we're gonna actually have someone intubated um, in OB because that just basically is as a last resort in a really emergency C-section. So we try not to do that. So that is a standard kind of OR setup, at least from the anesthesia perspective. I, I've been wanting to show you guys kind of an anesthesia cart, Pixis, um, the ventilator and all that kind of stuff. And if you want more information on what, how everything works, I can do future videos with that whenever I have time. I've got my coffee, I've got my computer set up, and I'm just going to hang out until somebody needs me. Three hit or miss with labor and delivery. Some days you're dead on your feet at the end of the day because you haven't even had time to eat breakfast or lunch and barely have enough time to go to the restroom and then the other days you know there you have some some breathing room so today we have some breathing room which is good um but gotta remain superstitious <laughs> did anybody else see that america's got talent cody lee segment oh my gosh if my eyes are red it's because i teared up all right it is now 12 30. <laughs> what is going on with this floor so I have put in, I put an epidural, did a spinal for a C-section, those are all finished, put in another epidural, and then after that I went and grabbed lunch, and um, now I'm just chilling. <laughs> so um, I worked on a blog post, and that is now live, and... I've asked some questions on Instagram stories and I'm going to answer them right now. Why do I get the shivers upon awakening from anesthesia? The reason why you get the shivers after anesthesia is that anesthesia has inhibitory effects on the body's thermoregulatory abilities. So there's a very simple fix. There's a quick injection of medicine that can go in your IV that will help stop the shivers. It's usually De Demerol or Meperidine, but um, a lot of narcotics will actually fix that. Any tips on how to prevent nausea after surgery due to anesthesia? So there are a couple things. Um, if you are 
told not to eat or drink anything past midnight make sure that you load yourself up on fluids safely um up until midnight um that will help when you're hydrated it helps prevent post-op nausea and vomiting but there are a lot of different factors sometimes it's unavoidable sometimes it's length of surgery sometimes it's just your genetic makeup for me i know even though i've never had general general anesthesia i know i would be very very high risk because i get motion sickness very easily i cannot look down on my phone in a moving vehicle or i'll get vertigo so if you are very prone to motion sickness you are a higher risk so one of the number one things you could do is just tell your anesthesiologist hey i've had nausea after anesthesia is there something you can do for me just i want to make you aware and if they know that you've had that problem then they will take measures to help prevent it so they'll go a little bit more hog wild on the anti-nausea medicines than a normal person and you can also ask for a scopolamine patch which is a motion sickness patch sticker that goes behind one of your ears um, there are some side effects to that like inability to read really fine print um, or um, very very dry mouth like to the point of cotton mouth i tell all of my patients that if that bothers them more than the prospect of nausea feel free to take it off wash your hands afterwards but the medicine will run out after three days anyway and any side effects you have are self-limited so they go away once you um take the patch off i was wondering do you work with respiratory therapists yes i do matter of fact i worked with one yesterday who i informed in endoscopy that a patient had really bad sleep apnea and so what we do is we work hand in hand with respiratory therapists because you respiratory therapists know like the vents like the ICU vents we use a totally different setup we have a vent that is on an anesthesia machine it's very very different and so they know all the ins and outs and quirks of these super high-tech vents especially in the ICU and CPAP and BiPAP and all that stuff so we asked for their help to come to the bedside to help set up and fit a patient for like CPAP or, or uh, or that's what I did yesterday but they did, did do so much more than that they basically are managing vents weaning uh, patients, extubating them. I mean, it varies based on the center and what their responsibilities are, but they are right up there with anesthesia and ENT for being um, airway, um, in charge of the airway. So, did you have to do a four-year residency? Love your videos. Thanks, Carly. Um, yes, I did. Four years is the standard minimum anesthesia residency for in the US. Are most anesthesiologists practicing in groups now? You will find most anesthesiologists with rare exceptions practice in a group because you need a group to be able to cover multiple places, multiple ORs, multiple sites where anesthesia is administered and um, be able to take call. So one person can't be on call 24 seven for the rest of their life. So um, it's just not safe. But where you might find someone works independently is they might be contract. So you can work for a group, but contract employee. So you can be like a 1099, is what we call it here. And that means that you are you create your own schedule, you are not an employee, you don't get benefits, you, you pick the days you wanna work, or they only call you in when they need you and they're short staff. There's more flexibility, but at the downside of flexibility is um, typically job security and um, kind of a steady income, it might vary a lot. Um, it just really depends on the situation. Another instance where someone might not be working in a group is if they work for, let's say a plastic surgeon's office where they do office-based procedures and office-based anesthesia, doesn't require uh, taking call, doesn't you know work basically just clinic hours and you're the only one there and maybe you're the only one who runs one OR the whole time. So yeah, I mean like, or one procedure room, something like that. So. That's always um, a possibility. I do hear people doing that. If you go into a procedure nervous and anxious, are you more likely to have complications with anesthesia or waking up? That's a really good question. In my, I don't know the answer to that, but um, as far as science or evidence-based um, literature, but I do find absolutely no difference with people's experience under anesthesia. However, I will say that a very anxious person, um, if you don't pre-treat it with some some or, like IV or oral benzodiazepine. If they're amped up the moment, like if it's just building and building the moment they undergo anesthesia, we always win, okay? Anesthesia always wins. You're always gonna go to sleep. <laughs> um, but the problem is it might take more. And so with more anesthesia is more side effects, like hypotension, like lowering blood pressure and, and us needing to fix that with another medication. So the best thing to do is to recognize your anxiety up front and form your anesthesiologist 
hope that they take you seriously and when it's safe um because you probably have to be hooked up to monitors and oxygen and stuff that they can give you some pre-treatment with some anti-anxiety medicine oh this is appropriate when working l d do you get emotional when the baby comes out <laughs> yes Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I'm literally like 10 steps ahead and I'm thinking about the next thing I need to do for that patient or I'm focusing on the patient or I am um, thinking about, you know, if anybody else needs epidurals while we're working, all that kind of stuff. But a lot of times I do get emotional, especially when the patient gets emotional. It gets me so excited. Like if, if there's a story behind it that they have shared with me like for example a long history of infertility and then they have their rainbow baby and it's a miracle baby and you know the baby's healthy and we are able to be a part of that experience that life-changing experience that that patient will remember forever um it is it can be very emotional and um you know of course the most emotional times are when things don't go well and thankfully that is very rare but um I'll, i will tell you one time one day i will tell you my story of my worst experience in anesthesia ever and it happened last year yeah last year what's the worst reaction you have seen from putting a patient under well think of the worst possible thing that could happen and i've seen it truly there's i've seen everything um i, I trained in a level one trauma facility so I've, I've literally seen everything i've seen heart stop i've seen um but that's all like based on multiple different factors like your normal average run of the mill come in for surgery and leave or stay for a couple days type of thing that just that stuff doesn't happen so i don't want you all to get scared but i have I have seen a lot, which means that you can recognize a lot, right? I mean, you want an ex you want your anesthesiologist to have seen everything because if they haven't seen it, then they might not anticipate it. You know what I mean? What are some tips to help get into an anesthesia program? I know they are very competitive. I'm going to speak specifically to medicine because I don't know diddly squat about getting into CRNA school or AA school, but for anesthesia, um, it is one of the most competitive specialties so you need really good step scores you need really good evaluations really good letter re letters of recommendation and you need something moving with regards to like a personal statement not like everybody else's like i fell in love with intubating and stuff like that the other thing that nobody really talks about a whole lot is networking like network with your people what like the the key to getting into a really competitive specialty like anesthesia is having someone who you have inspired enough or you have connected with enough that will be your advocate that's really important someone says are you always on call or do you rotate how does that work also if you get if you have kids and you get a page from home what do you do with kids that's a great question so when i was taking a lot of call in north carolina i didn't have kids obviously and so if i got a call i just went in and you need to be close to a hospital you typically 30 minutes or less and um that still is possible with kids but you have to have either someone like a, an emergency babysitter who's always around typically the best person is a grandma so one of your parents if they're always available don't go out of town very often like don't live really close by or you know take care of your child or children all the time then you can have them come over if they're willing um and at all hours of the of the night you know whenever that may be um, or a spouse if you have a spouse who has a regular nine-to-five job and can be there at home when, you know in the middle of the night when you get paged then that's fine too for me it's so variable with HB being a call taking surgeon and me being an anesthesiologist most anesthesiologists take call however we found out last year that was just not going to be possible especially as he got much busier in his practice he's um, sort of a new orthopedic surgeon and building his practice and it got very busy very quickly and we um just felt like there was not a whole lot of stability for our child if she if her parents were being called away all the time so i took a pay cut as i mentioned in a previous video in one of my um assumptions videos that i took a pay cut and i make probably make about 75 percent maybe less of what i did before when i was taking call so but all of that what that gives me is um a lighter schedule i take no call unless i want to sign up for some which i haven't done that yet um and i've been here over a year i take no call i work no holidays i work no weekends and i work in such a way that i work all of my 40 hours in four days i work four 10-hour shifts so i come to the hospital at 6 30 6 45 in the morning and i leave at five sometimes later 
um, which is overtime. So that's how my schedule works. And then I get a day off to do pediatrician appointments and run errands and get my hair, my eyelashes done or whatever I have to do that I can't do because I'm working 10 hour days. Um, I do on Friday. Do you do, do any type of follow-up with patients after their procedures? That's a good question. In most cases, no, because it's not necessary. Most patients have gone home, you know, they're, they don't even talk to their surgeon until their post-op visit. So there's really no need unless there is an issue. Um, if there's a particular scenario where, you know, we want to watch out on, for someone or something, you know, was a little bit concerning, then yeah, I'll follow up with them. Um, where I typically follow up with the most and what you'll see more regularly is when someone has had a pain injection, pain procedure, um, or has had a spinal with a long acting medication, we follow them for 24 hours. So they're usually in the hospital anyway, and I like to follow in on them. We make sure that they're peeing okay, that they're getting up and walking, and that everything went okay, and we follow up more consistently with that type of situation situation. Can you safely get an epidural if you have scoliosis in two areas? Yes, absolutely. I've done epidurals in patients with scoliosis. Um, a lot of people have undiagnosed scoliosis and so I, you know, tell them you have a little bit of scoliosis once I'm done with their epidural. But um, also patients who have had, oh I forget what it's called, but the procedure with the rods um, as, you know, what is helpful is if you want an epidural and you come in and bring your films, if you have any like copies of your records or films, typically like a, an image or something, or like on a CD, um, if you have an MRI or x-ray or something like that, if you bring that in, your anesthesi anesthesiologist will be more than happy to review those films and tell you whether or not they think an epidural can be safely performed. Why when I get my epidural during childbirth do they ask my husband to leave the room? Okay, so this is a good question. Number one, it's a sterile procedure, and in order to maintain sterility, you want to have the, the least amount of people to safely do the job. So you um, want the nurse so she can watch the patient and you want the anesthesiologist. Plus or minus a CRNA if they're helping with charting or helping set up the pump or something like that. What we don't want is two patients in the room, meaning we don't want the dad to freak out because he sees a needle this long going into his wife's back and faints, which has happened on I, any of y'all work in labor and delivery, you've probably seen it. Um, and so we need to be able to focus on what the patient at hand and while not while a needle is sticking in her back that some guy's fainting in the corner and then so that can you know we don't want to divide our loyalties and our attention between the patient and now a second patient so that number one it's a safety thing number two is a sterility thing and number three interestingly enough when families or members are in the room young women or women of any age tend to act out a little bit more so it's kind of like um, it's the opposite of acting tough it's kind of like look at all the things I have to do and I, I'm going through for this baby and for us and it's a psychological thing um, so my I learned very quickly in my training get it, kick everybody out because when mom is by herself with us she is much more stoic, she's more still, she's more calm, and the whole procedure goes much smoother and much safer. And that's what matters. So it doesn't matter that someone gets to watch, you know, the procedure. Have I let people do it who have insisted or who have been in, um, in healthcare and are just curious and want to watch and seem like they have nerves of steel? Sure, I've done it. I don't like it, but I do it. Was residency hard? Yes, <laughs> residency was hard. Do you do many central lines? Um, it depends on the area that you work in. I don't typically, thank God, have to do a lot of central lines anymore, but if you do cardiac, you do a central line for every single patient. I, Madeline says, I want to be an anesthesiologist and I'm only in ninth grade. Is there something I can do now? Um, you can shadow if you want. You could. That's definitely something you could add to your resume when you are applying on your application. You could talk about how you've been uh, shadowing anesthesiologists for four or five years. That would definitely be something you can do, but other than that, not really. When is it too late to get the epidural? If you are complete, if you are fully effaced, completely effaced, if you are 10 centimeters dilated, ready to push, it is too late to get an epidural. Sorry. <laughs> Um, do you find it hard to give an epidural if the woman is having contractions during the process? Um, all of the women are having contractions during the process. Every single one, 100% of the time, they're all contracting because they're in labor and they're hurting and that's why they get the epidural, typically. No, my only issue that makes it hard, and I reason why I'll step back and I'll just wait, is if they are finding it so, again, kind of going back to the, the issue of, um, 
acting out if they are they feel the need to like writhe around and move their body with every contraction i, I don't i tell them i say i'm not going to stick this big of a needle <laughs> you know well i don't say that but i say well unfortunately it's not safe to do the procedure if you're going to be moving so i'll just wait until you're you find it yourself in a place where you don't feel compelled to move and that typically i mean peep the mind over matters is really is true and real let me tell you because they they put their selves in a mindset where they're like okay and they just stand still they sit still for a few minutes while i pop the epidural in and then they can move around all they want i don't care but i i will do the the procedure for them i just will only do it if it's safe so i'm gonna answer one more question because i've been talking for 20 minutes wondering if the horror stories are true about the epidural only working on one side so yes absolutely um i myself have placed a couple of one-sided epidurals now typically it's a mixture of an anatomical abnormality and or just you you want to go straight in the midline between the two spinous processes right and you want to kind of go in a vector that's like this straight back if you go like this then the with the needle then the catheter that gets thread through the needle may go up on one side and you may get more of a block on one side or the other i myself had a stronger block on one side i can't remember which one but i was still numb on both sides it's very rare to actually have complete numbness on one side and and feeling everything on the other because it's all kind of one big system so unless you have something anatomically like you've had surgery on your back on your spine specifically and there's been some sort of scar tissue that blocks the medicine from going to the other side typically you're not going to experience that one thing you can do is you put the bad side down so the side that you're feeling you lay on the bed with your bad side down and gravity will help pull that medicine to that other side so that you can numb up the nerves on that side say like i've come on board and um, one of my colleagues has placed an epidural in the middle of the night and maybe it's one-sided i told them we can try and, and mess with this one but if ultimately you're not satisfied then we'll just take it out and we'll try again there's always a chance that you have something with your anatomy that's going to make that happen again but it's worth a shot and so i offer it to them um, I'd say 50% of the time they're they're fine with w whatever measures we offer them and then 50 the other 50% of the time They just opt to have the epidural done again ultimately It's about making that patient as comfortable as possible until baby is born and um, if that means replacing the epidural Then that means replacing the epidural. Okay, it's 4 30. That's it. Very 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 quiet day can't complain whatsoever about the day um, Yeah, really enjoyed just being able to sit and talk to you guys and see a couple patients, do a couple of epidurals. I went and did another one, by the way, and maybe three or four, and one spinal for C-section, and everyone is happy, healthy. And my best friend just had her third baby today. I'm so excited. <laughs> oh, congratulations, Paula. I'm so excited. But anyway, so I'm gonna get, go ahead. Um, this, my colleague already came, who is gonna be relieving me at five. He is on call all night so from te technically i took the shift from 7 a.m to 5 p.m because that's the hours i work so i'm doing that for him so he can go do other things like ortho or whatever and um then he's gonna be here for i guess the rest of the night at until 6 30 6 45 tomorrow morning so um hopefully it should be a pretty good night for that guy and um so he came and dropped his stuff off and he went to a meeting and he's gonna come back and then i'm gonna go so my laptop is right there and i'm gonna get my bag and pack it up i have noticed that housekeeping hasn't come to clean the call bed so i think i'm just gonna give them a call so that my colleague will have a nice fresh bed this is left over from the person who was on call the night before there so i thought it would be nice to just have them come Hi, Sean. Can you transfer me to housekeeping, please? Thank you. Hi there. This is Dr. Brawley. Um, can someone come and uh, clean the call room on Bloor Labor and Delivery, please? The the anesthesia um, doctor call room. Thank you. Bye bye. And I've already washed out my Yeti. I need to pack up.
word on the street is that one of my colleagues accidentally flooded this call room at last weekend while filling something up and then having to go rush to an emergency or something. And so that's the scoop. That's why I've been having to deal with this all day. I actually put these little boots on. I think I mentioned that already. To mitigate the sticky. So that is going to be it for my another episode of a day in the life of the anesthesiologist i hope you enjoyed it if you did please don't forget to like the video and subscribe if you haven't already and i will see you in my next video bye guys